The virtual CISO moment is brought to you by VCISO Services, a leading provider of quality and experienced virtual chief information security officers for small and mid-sized businesses. Check them out at vcisoservices.com. Hi, I'm Greg Schaefer, and welcome to the virtual CISO moment. We have Christian Espinosa with us today. He is a cybersecurity expert, an entrepreneur, an Air Force veteran, and also the author of The Smartest Person in the Room. Christian, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me on this morning, Greg. Appreciate it. So I would love to hear your journey in cyber, starting from, as I understand, your days in the Air Force and all the way through building a business and then selling the business and now writing a book and going out and speaking about that. So can you bring us through that? I'll give a quick synopsis. I was in the Air Force. I did communications in the Air Force. Uh, and most of my jobs in the Air Force involved information security or information assurance. After I got out of the Air Force, after about six years, I became a defense contractor and I did cybersecurity then as well. I traveled to many different Air Force bases and optimized their networks and helped secure them. And then I took a job with a commercial company. I became a VP of like security products. And while I was at that job, I had a kind of a run in with a CEO and we didn't see eye to eye. So that was a defining moment for me where I just quit that job because like the stress I was feeling was too much. I just quit it without having another job lined up. And then I thought, you know what? I've got quite a few contacts. So why don't I try freelance work? So I did freelance work for about five years. Uh, I did cybersecurity training. I traveled the world training people on CISSP, Security Plus, reverse engineering malware, d different topics. And then I got kind of bored with that. So I thought one way to make myself grow and to contribute at a higher level is to form a company. So I formed my company in 2014, Alpine Security. Uh, we did cybersecurity services. We didn't sell products. So we did penetration testing primarily, uh, vCISO services as well. And then in 2020, I sold that company to Cerberus Sentinel. They're a publicly traded company on NASDAQ, mm -hmm. uh, ticker symbol CISO, ironically, yeah, which yeah, is a good yeah. ticker, symbol, <laughs> ticker symbol to have. And I saw that and I'm like, well, I guess I can never bring my company public because I can't get that ticker symbol. So <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, it's good forward thinking of them to get CISO. And then through my experience with my own company, I realized that 99% of the problems I had with my company were really due to a lack of people skills with my highly technical staff. So because of that, I worked hard to solve that challenge to basically add the people skills or the emotional intelligence to the already super brilliant, you know, rationally intelligent, high IQ staff I had. And I felt like that helped push my company to the next level because we, you know, weren't a typical cybersecurity company that spoke over people's head. We worked on communication. Uh, we worked on empathy. We worked on emotional intelligence and things that really helped us succeed as an organization. Uh, and, and the things that worked, I ended up writing about in my book. So before we get to the book, I'm a little bit curious about the Air Force journey at first for a couple of reasons. First of all, thank you for your service. I, I am um, Air Force veteran myself as well, although I was a mechanic, I wasn't an infosec. Um, and I'm curious, um, was did you go into the Air Force with that specialty in mind, or was that something that came about after you joined the Air Force, like uh, the you were placed into it, like through an ASVAB or something like that? I joined the Air Force because I saw Top Gun, <laughs> the original <laughs> Top Gun. I know it's about the Navy, but I applied to all the uh, military academies and wanted to fly jets. I thought the Air Force uh, had the best program. And it just so happened to be like the year before I graduated, they cut all the pilot slots. And then with the year I graduated, they cut all the pilot slots. So I would have had to keep up reapplying. Uh, it used to be if you went to the Air Force Academy, you're guaranteed a pilot slot. Mm -hmm. But that didn't happen. So my secondary choice was communications. OK, OK. Yeah. Actually, I sort of had a dream about doing that as well, too. But I never went through the process of trying to apply for the uh, for any of the academies. But uh Love Top Gun. I, I I worked that movie when I was um, between high school and college that summer, and uh, could quote almost the entire movie. So, <laughs> Me too. and and I'll try not to do it here, but one or two quotes may come out. Yeah. So, so a very long list of experience, and and I really want to dive into the smartest person in the room. Um. So, I I guess 
first, when or why did you have that? What, what was the impetus for you to like decide, hey, I'm going to write a book? Uh, the impetus was I, I felt like I was at the point in my career where I wanted to contribute more to help other people. So the book is really not for me. I, I think the book is transformational. If you write a book, it should be transformational for the person writing it. But I felt like, you know, I had two choices, basically. I was getting very frustrated with the industry of cybersecurity. And I thought about leaving the industry because the people always posturing as the smartest person in the room and this, you know, this attitude, uh, like I'm smarter than you, was starting to drive me crazy. And I thought, well, I've been in the industry for like a long time, like 25 plus years at the time. So I thought, why don't I try to do something about it versus just leave the industry? Uh, and, and that, along with my journey in my company, was the impetus to write the book. I felt like if I can shortcut someone's learnings so, so they don't have to make the same mistakes I do or have an impact on the industry to kind of like, you know, open our, our eyes to the elephant in the room because we already have the technology, we already have the frameworks, we just are lacking in specific areas which inhibit collaboration and communication with clients and communication with the board. I felt like if I could at least start to address that, that that might help the industry as a whole. So according, I'm reading off of the Amazon page here that your book shows how to leverage your company's smartest minds to your benefit and theirs. So, so can you dive into that a little bit? I believe a lot of people in cybersecurity and high tech industries get their significance by being smarter than other people. And if that is your identity, you believe you're smarter than other people. Technically you do things to make that real or true for you, which means at a meeting, you might talk over somebody's head because if they don't understand you, that means you're smarter than them. It means with your team, you might look for a moment to uh, tell your team like, well, how come you don't already know that you should know that by now. So these things I believe, inhibit teamwork, inhibit communication with clients, and, I, and it holds people at a glass ceiling. Highly technical people are held at a glass ceiling and they wonder why they're not getting promoted because they're super rationally smart. So the missing component is that emotional intelligence or the EQ skills or people skills, which I believe if combined with someone with already a super high IQ or rational intelligence, that person's uh, potential is pretty much unlimited. Uh, but for some reason, a lot of people think that they are they, they don't have the ability to learn people skills but just like anything else it is a learnable skill and we all have people in our lives you know we all have parents most of us have kids most of us have a spouse so the people skills won't just help with the work environment they'll help in your life in general no i completely agree with that one of the what i think is one of the most important certifications um, that i got in my cyber career if you will uh, really has nothing to do with cyber or infosec. It was um, about 10 or 12 years ago uh, through Toastmasters. I got the competent communicator and the competent leader mm -hmm. and uh, those two certifications. And what I found from it is that Toastmasters, a lot of times people like think of Toastmasters as being, oh, you know, that'll help me to speak better in public. And um, I don't want to be a public speaker, so I, I don't care about it. But actually, it's the other way around, I think that it helps you to better become a better communicator in these types of situations, it helps you to, to listen more. I think sometimes I, I like to say sometimes, you know, we're, we're made with uh, two eyes, two ears and, and one mouth. So what's the more important thing, the ingestion of, of information, not, not speaking. Yeah. Um, is that sort of gel with what you're discussing in the book, those sorts of skills? I would say yes. I, I think uh, I used to be part of Toastmasters. I think communication for anybody is is a, a skill that if you can master, it'll you know remove that glass ceiling, or if you can get better at it. So to, yeah, I, those are the skills I'm referring to, like the soft skills, the people skills. Communication is step four in my methodology. Uh, I'm a believer that uh, the meaning of communication is the response you get. So if you're not getting the response that you intend from the person, then we're not receiving your message. So the ownership should shift to you to change how you communicate. And you mentioned listening. I think a lot of people in cybersecurity and a lot of people in general, they listen for something to agree with or disagree with versus listening for some insight 
about what's going on in the other person's world. And I think that's extremely important. Oh, so they're listening for information that supports their bias or their or their point of view? I believe most people are, especially technical people, yes. Versus just list, act, actually listening to see, you know, what insight can be gained from what the person is, is communicating with you, to you. It seems like that sometimes in information cybersecurity um, that there's a, now I don't know the best way to say this, but but sometimes like, like maybe an ego problem, um, for lack of a better word, is, is yeah. that sort of an impediment? I, I would almost think that in some ways, I, I get back to the title, the smartest person in the room. I never like to think of myself as the smartest person in the room, even if I am. Um, but there's, there's, there seems to be a little bit of an ego, particularly when you get to the CISO level in cybersecurity. Um, assuming that that may be the case for some people, what is, in your opinion, a, a first step that they could do to recognize and not let that be an impediment to their communication in these sorts of circumstances? The first step, I believe, you know, it always starts with awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I talk about awareness and, and the book is the first step. Uh, and understanding that where trying to be the smartest person in the room, where that's inhibiting you and, and how that's coming across from an awareness perspective to other people. Because uh, people want to feel understood and appreciated and if you're always trying to be smarter than them they're probably not going to feel understood and appreciated they're probably not going to open up to you your your rapport is not going to be built very well and your relationships are going to be very superficial mm -hmm. uh, and it's also a matter from an awareness perspective of like how do you measure what you're smarter than somebody in like you know if somebody can communicate better does that than you or they have better tools in that area does that mean you're still smarter than them like what are we comparing uh you know there's more to skills in life than just technical skills. And I think a lot of people in cybersecurity think because someone doesn't understand our vernacular, we, we have a lot of acronyms, uh, or they don't understand technically what we're talking about, that they're stupid. But typically, whoever we're communicating with, that's not their role. The role is something else. And, and if we flip the script and say, well, this person is the, the business leader of my organization, I don't understand, you know, as a cybersecurity professional, everything about business. So are they saying that I'm not as smart as them too? You know, it's like, where do you like stop this assessment? You know, it's kind of a uh, silly, I think. Well, and that's, that's a very good point because um, even if we are the smartest in our own uh, profession, we're, we're definitely not the smartest in, in with regards to the business processes. And one of the, not only for a CISO, but for for um, all, I would say all positions in information security and cybersecurity that you need to have at least some fundamental awareness of what the business does and and what it doesn't do, why it's important, and all of that, as opposed to just being heads down and and trying to do your job, so to speak, because. It could get to be very frustrating if you're, say, a SOC analyst or something like that, and mm -hmm. you find that there's this risk somewhere, this vulnerability on a scan or, or, or what have you, and you present that to um, your manager, your director, or even to the CISO or the board of directors, and they accept the risk because they have knowledge of the business in other areas. Sometimes in information security, the that analyst then gets all upset and mm -hmm. they take it personally as if like, why didn't they listen to me? And, and I guess that gets back to being the, the, having the idea of being the smartest person in the room that they think that they're smarter than, than the other folks there. Cybersecurity is a support industry. A lot of people forget that. Like the whole pur purpose of cybersecurity is to, to support a business. If there were no businesses or other industries, there and the point you mentioned, I've, I've witnessed the same thing. One of the things that we tend to, I think, do a poor job in cybersecurity is risk assessment. We look at the, the likelihood of something happening, but we don't look at the impact. The impact is typically tied to the, the, the business and what that system 
does for that business. Uh, and we kind of ignore that and just look at like what Nessus or some vulnerability tool tells us. Uh, and the other thing is I like, talked about communication. If you really believe this is a massive vulnerability based on your experience with the, the business and with the, the um, exploit or the, you know, that can be taken advantage of the vulnerability, then the ownership is on you to communicate that in a way that leadership or management of your company takes the action you think they should take. Instead of just getting frustrated to think maybe next time, how do I communicate this differently in a way that the message is received? And that's what I'm talking about. The ownership of communication should be shifted back on you. But we often just throw up our hands and like, they just don't get it. And then we go in the next meeting. Oh, they just don't get it. We just repeat this process over and over and over. And we just get frustrated. Whereas it, the ownership is on us to change how we communicate. So they do get it. I mean, that's, that's what our role is in cybersecurity. So, it, it's it's very important that that we learn the language to a sort of an extent of some of the other business units and the people that we are dealing with. That's essentially what you're saying. A hundred percent. Like I said, we're a, a support industry, and without the business that we're working with, we wouldn't have a, a need for cybersecurity. So we should learn how to communicate with the people we're interfacing with that, that run the business, 100%. I often say that one of the um, most important roles of the CISO is for them to act as a translator. Um, the translator between the technical mm -hmm. of IT and the business, the translator between risk to the organization and auditors. A lot of times auditors will come in and they'll say, you don't have this one control in place, mm -hmm. um, therefore you're bad. But if But the CISO should be able to translate and understand the compensating controls that are in place that mitigate the risk. And so I think that that particularly as you progress further in your career and you deal with more a more eclectic group of folks, that it becomes more and more important to have that awareness of being able to communicate with other folks like that. Um, but something, as you were talking a problem kind of like thought in my, it came to my mind. What if you're in a meeting and you have two that feel that they're the smartest in the room? And I'm sure you've been in situations like this before where it becomes, let's say you have five people, six people in the meeting, and then you have two and they're constantly talking over each other and the others are sort of silent and, and, and kind of kept out of the meeting. Um, how can you, sh first of all, short circuit that in a meeting and then, then longer term implement actions to prevent that from happening? That's a fairly common problem. <laughs> I, I understand. I can like picture the exact scenario where you have a, a meeting <laughs> with like eight people and two people are just fighting about who's who's right about something everyone else is just kind of sitting in the background i'm sure everybody age. right now has their own picture <laughs> and they're they have their own story it's just yeah well, bob and sue were doing that just last week so and it's so annoying and i just want to anyway that that could be some good advice there what any suggestions what i did with my company is really focus on the culture of the organization and adherence to core values uh so we established core values which i used to think were kind of you know, BS, I thought, like, who needs core values? Like, everyone understands these things. But I realized most of the problems I had in the company were were not just a lack of people skills, a lack of alignment with what I believed, you know, the, the world, from my model of the world. Uh, so I believe in ownership, and I believe in flexibility and the growth mindset and things like that. And, you know, listening carefully and responding clearly, for instance. Uh, so I mitigated that two people battling sort of scenario because they each thought they're smarter than the other one by really focusing on the culture and and it, those core values. So if somebody didn't align to the core values, I would get rid of that person. And then I made hiring decisions based on the core values. It seems like a simple thing to do, but it's not simple. A culture just doesn't organically happen. You have to like enforce that culture. Uh, and that, you know, it didn't prevent those problems all the time, but it helped mm -hmm. us kind of reset and say, wait a minute, you know, what is the outcome we're seeking here in this meeting? Let's give everyone a chance to contribute because everyone has some value to add. And that, you know, we all realized that that was one of our core values. So people would kind of like, oh, okay, there was an ability to reset there. 
I think with uh, leadership as well, um, those who are in positions of leadership, these skills could definitely come into play because I, I have one one example from many years ago, early in my career, and we all make mistakes in our career. And this is this is a big one that I made. Um, I started this position. I was in charge of the data networking, the team there. And there was a um, system, I think it was for network monitoring that was taking, um, apparently it was taking the staff, the person who was leading that project, taking them way too long to get up and running. And mm. the person who I was reporting to at the time, the CIO, was frustrated with me. I had been there for only about a month or two. I was frustrated with the other person. And what I ended up doing is I completely took that project away from the other person and I wanted to do it myself. And when I told him I was doing that, I can still visualize the look on his face. I knew right then and there, I made the worst mistake. And what was I doing? I was thinking that I was the smartest person in the room. It's like, you can't do it. I can do it. And I have now told you that not only am I the smartest person in the room, but you're the dumbest person in the room. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. so I think that there, there are things in your book, and I definitely want to dive into it and read more, that transcend just some of the original things I was thinking about. Um, I, I, is, it, is it safe to say that uh, enhancing leadership skills is something that is a, an outcropping of what you've written about as well? A hundred percent. And I think with leadership, we often focus on like thinking we need to lead others, but I talk a lot about self-leadership uh, and leadership of yourself. I think leadership starts with how we lead ourselves. And if we don't lead ourselves very well, we can't lead other people. So all the skills in my book uh, can be embodied to how you lead your yourself and your day-to-day -day life, really. And what an example too in in a real world example in cybersecurity where of course we do awareness training on an, on a regular basis but there are so many times you hear that the executive team the ceo says i don't need to take that well what's the example that they're setting there that's not leadership you're not leading by example you're actually doing exactly the opposite so well i know that you've got a lot going on. Um, certainly writing a book, speaking about it, having gone through the process of becoming an entrepreneur and leading a cybersecurity company, all of this stuff, you can't be doing this 24 by seven by 365. You've got to get away from it on occasion and decompress. What's one of the things that you do to get you away from all of that stress? I do Ironman triathlons. Uh, oh, <laughs> it's my. A, it's a different level of stress in itself, but it's like a physical stress and a little bit mental. And I do a lot of hiking in nature. Uh, I seem to find, you know, hiking in nature grounds me pretty good. It's a good way to get away from, like, computer screens. <laughs> Same thing with Ironman triathlon. It's a little it's a little more extreme, though, than hiking. <laughs> I, I totally agree with the hiking and the fresh air and just getting away. And uh, although I'll still take my phone with me, I say it's for, um, you know, safety purposes in case something happens or, but, you know, am yeah. I checking my email during the hike? Well, maybe every now and then, <laughs> but now as far as Ironman, I got a lot of respect. I have done several marathons in my life. Okay. Yeah. I think I'm done with that because the training for a marathon, those 20 mile runs towards the end of the mm -hmm. training cycle, I mean, they just and running is one of the worst things you can do for your for your knees. But uh, <laughs> but I, I, I my excuse for never having done a triathlon was simply that you know, I can do the running or I back in the day, I could do the running, I could do the biking. But I, I if I swim, I sink. And so I remember a buddy of mine telling me about 10 years ago, well, you know, if you wear a wetsuit, you're fine. You won't sink. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. Stop it. You're taking away my excuse. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Most Iron Man, you wear a wetsuit during the swim, so you're buoyant. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a great way for uh, for um, definitely dealing with stress, maybe introducing, a, as you said, a different type of stress, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so so what are your future plans? you have another um, book that you're working on? or um... Yeah, I have a book. I'm revising the book right now. Uh, it's not about cybersecurity. It's about what I call the um, in-between, the micro moments of life, really. Uh, how I think we often go through life looking at 
one goal or another goal and we forget all the stuff in the middle. And if we approach the stuff in the middle or in the in-between with some intention, we can add some more fulfillment to our lives and, mm-hmm. and, and some excitement and kind of get out of that zombie state I think a lot of us find ourselves in. So it's about that. It's more of a memoir style book. Like the things where I feel like I've got it right, where I've got it wrong, and hopefully somebody can learn something from that. And then I've been doing a lot of real estate investing. Uh, I, I left the parent company in June, uh, so I've been doing quite a bit of real estate investing. I have started another cybersecurity company, uh, mainly for referrals because I speak quite a bit and mm-hmm. I get a lot of leads that way. I spoke in um, Atlantic City uh, last week. I gave a, a cybersecurity seminar there, and I got quite a few leads from there as well. Oh, good, good. Well. This has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. The name of the book, again, is The Smartest Person in the Room, and it's available on Amazon and all of the normal sites that you would find books. So really appreciate your time on the podcast today, Kristen. Yeah, I appreciate you having me, Greg. All right, everybody, stay secure. <laughs>